Well, Kyle? Yes, Garrett. Is this too early in the video to cuss? No, 15 seconds have passed. Go for it. This is my shit. It's nice. I mean, we said it before, 5.3 is such an end. You would have to, even with the many months of like actual production time and getting it to the players, you would have to take a little breath. It'd be too much to just dive right back in to complete madness. It's a nice little check-in back on Eorzea, Heidelin. I don't want to call it that anymore. The, the planet, the source. We're back on the source. You know, we're doing a Realm Reborn stuff for the most part. It's, it's chill. You could say we're back to Eorzea. Yes, but the, well, there's, there's towers over on... That's like the Yanshan. last 0.001% yeah. of this patch, Kyle. It's mostly a And it's yeah. from a phone call. You don't even go there. I mean, you went there. I went, I there. went there to go yes. take a look. But it's we, in the MSQ cutscenes. It's just a phone call. Yeah. You'd think those towers would like mess up cell signals or something. <laughs> don't go in there, man. <laughs> it's not a 5G joke. That shit's played out. Y'all need to get new jokes. The height of 5G jokes. I mean, it's worth saying there is some uh, artifacts in here of the time it was produced in. Some odd voice mixing. Some uh, just odd voices. One very odd voice that just doesn't sound like the character at all. Good work, you two. This is all we ask for and more. Quite a lot more. Now that I, look at it. I mean, it's been a while since Sid has participated in the MSQ. Ah, of all the things they could have picked to play with, that's not a toy, you bloody fools, it's a primal! Yeah, uh, in voice cutscenes, yes. Actually, and, and just in general, the MSQ. I mean, he was dead and, like, worked really hard for his whole life. <laughs> if we're talking about Days of Future Past, Grahatia, yes, yes. Exactly, yes, the, 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 the not Sid, the second Sid, A Sid, B Sid kind of thing going on. But, uh, yeah, yeah could, could, you know, forgot the voice a little bit. It happens sometimes. I love the hand wave moment. At least I took it as a hand wave moment, by the way, in this. It's like, blink and you miss it. But Sid's like, oh, I'm so glad future me cracked it, so I don't need to bother with this. It, it, to me, it felt like the writer's going, we're not going to introduce time travel into the <laughs> main story arc. I appreciate that. It's fine for your one movie and your one expansion, but let's not burden down the whole business. Yeah, unless unless your like entire fiction hinges on it, I typically would rather we stay away from time travel. It was a fun jaunt, and now we're back to Eorzea doing politics, Realm Reborn. Game of Thrones kind of business. I, I half expected more to go wrong just so it was more Game of thrones -y again, but... I don't think I've ever enjoyed such a tame patch more. This is S-tier basic patch. Recovery. is a way to put it. Yeah, S-tier recovery. This, to me, is like, what if Realm Reborn patch content was good or interesting? Which, yes, bit of shade on Realm Reborn, and there's parts of a Realm Reborn patch content I do enjoy. But in general, I think a lot of us find it pretty slow. And uh, I think this is slow, but in a really enjoyable way. Uh, if nothing else, fine, I'll say it selfishly. This kind of feels like if I got to choose how patch content would go, this is how I would have it go. I love this. They touched on so many little dangling threads that I wanted, including one very specific scene that I requested when Jesse Cox started grilling us and I got it exactly. But we're not to that part of the story yet to talk about it. So let's get into it, Kyle. All right, well, it's time to go on Alizé's quest, check in on the Archons, see our good buddy, Lee. talk about before Sybil. That, what? Before that. What? Optional dialogue. Wait. You were able to go into the sickness room. Oh! Important optional dialogue. Yes, the important optional dialogue that one of us loves, loves going and spending time with, and the other one of us kicks and screams like a child who just wants to go back on the ride at Disney. Uh, it's so different than like checking in on the Normandy, you know, walking around the castle in Dragon Age, just seeing what people have to say, and you only get one chance, like, and then it's gone. So sometimes, sometimes it's completely useless, right? 
As per usual, Oriange is up to something. He wants to go with Thancred. No rogue wants the wizard to join in the stealth mission. What are you up to, Oriange? But before all that happens, you talk to Oriange, and he says something a little interesting. He says, by thine account, the 14th seat of the convocation was known as Azem. Azim? Azim. We hear all three versions. I've been going with Azem. At the title's distinctly familiar ring, mine imagination could not fail but run wild. From Azima, the Warden, in Eorzea to Azim, the Dawnfather, in the Far East, in nigh every corner of Hydaelyn, do those deities revered as personifications of the sun share like names? Could they all perhaps trace their origin to the 14th seat? I did muse. Though it may be proven otherwise... Such a theory, I do believe, lieth firmly within the realm of possibility. This is a lot of words to say all these names sound similar. Yes. And we might be a god. Which is kind of cool. May, may, maybe? But the Amoratines were essentially just people. Super powerful people. And by comparison to what we are capable of, godlike. I can't think of a good example where it comes from now, but the thing that happens in so many movies when it's like, to them, we must look like ants. We must look like insects to you. And it's like, I don't think we're quite ant quality on terms of the tier compared to the more teens, considering we've thrown down and, and killed multiple paragons of the source at this point. But maybe like a, I don't know, a dog or a wolf, like something that's not as lethal, but could still kill you if you don't respect it. What interests me more about this is that we might be bringing in all the gods. And but that would be a fine. I mean, kill the Pantheon. Like, why not? We're going to kill God anyway. Let's go kill the Pantheon. The lore about the deities is something I have almost entirely ignored. Uh, going all the way back to when I created my character, asked my good friend Kyle, hey, does it matter what deity I pick? And your answer was not at all. I, t I took that and I went, don't care. Just ejected my my desire to pay attention to any of that lore uh, from my brain. And, and also, to be fair, I feel like it just really hasn't come up all that much. There's little references here and there, but it's not like we sat down with a librarian on the first and they were like, hey, let me tell you the tale of the uh, Azam, the sun god or whatever. Although that does make me think if, if, if that's tied to us and are we tied to Heidelin? No, we're not tied to Heidelin, right? Because we got the name of the person that became the actual sacrificing uh, or sacrificial soul to become Heidelin. But Heidelin is light, sun is light. Are, are we tied to Heidelin? Is there a, a Mortine that's tied to some god that's tied to the lunar side of things? I don't know my deities in Final Fantasy fourteen, but I'm assuming if there's a sun god, there's a, a darkness god or a lunar god. There's a lot about the sun and the moon in Stormblood, especially when you go out to the Azim Step and all of the allusions to Yasuyu's tie to like the daughter of the moon and eventually becoming a moon themed primal. Orianje brings up brings up Azim, the Dawn Father, which is like the deity out in the step. That's yeah. that's the sun god that we we got lore on that's pretty fuzzy, but I remember talking to the the older dude up on the, the bowl city. The big bowl. Yeah, the big the, bowl. The big bowl that I thought was going to be more of a set piece than it ended up being. Like, like a lot of that feels like a million years ago for me now, probably because it took us so long to get through Shadowbringers. The moon is interesting, right? Because we can say the moon bound Zodiac in the moon. Zodiac is the moon. There's all sorts of like direct relations we can do there. But Heidelin and the Flood of Light, that's just light. The sun is something very different. And in most mythologies, the sun is a traveler because it goes from point A to point B across the sky. So I think it's a perfect connection for what we've heard of Azim as a wandering adventurer. That's how most mythologies treat the sun, is some sort of chariot or uh, traveler that makes their way. Wouldn't the moon also be a traveler then? Because it orbits. It, this, yeah, the moon's never really given the same reference, but you know... Not as cool the moon. <laughs> not, not as useful that moon. Cool. I mean, the moon is cool. Not as useful. Sir, the moon freaking, like, like okay, yeah, okay, all right, sure. You go Piccolo, kill the moon, and see what happens to our tide levels, all right? It's I a little important. Kill the sun instead, and I mean, we're really doomed then. You blow up the moon, <laughs> like, stuff's bad, sure. But you take away the sun, it's all over. Okay, fair, you won. Congratulations. Yeah. So well, where are you going with all of this? Why, why, why did you bring up Orianje's crazy, wacky, optional dialogue theory? Why did Orianje bring up that? 
I'm bringing up the fact that he brought it up. That's all I'm doing. All I'm you did was bring it up to say, why did he bring it up? Why would he bring this up? This seems like a weird thing. But the <laughs> thing is, Oriange, while it is long winded, rarely brings up useless information. Him in the library, him messing with the Warriors of Darkness, all of it has come to fruition. So mm. what's he up to here? And why is it hidden in an optional dialogue moment? Probably, I, I would assume, much like Emmett, it's kind of in like a half-baked phase. Not that the writers were half-baked, but we're not using this information yet. So we're just planting that seed. Maybe we'll use this later, you know, push it into the soil. Let's get caught up with the Scions. Before we even get into a cutscene, I think it's Kryl. It's basically just, hey, just in case you were worried, Scions are totally fine. No lingering effects. We're not a ticking clock. You don't need to worry about it. Did they actually successfully meld into their bodies and all of that stuff that Orianje took 15 paragraphs to pontificate about? It was just there for flavor. The threat of it was good, but it's nice to have it resolved behind us as we move towards Endwalker. And move back into Stormblood, because Lise is back. The famous Lise Hext, former Scion and hero of the Alamegan Resistance. And honestly, this a lot of this gave me... A, 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 this feels like a, a Realm Reborn 2 and Stormblood 2, simultaneously. I mean, that makes sense. We basically set up a massive political sphere and then abandoned it. But we also have this really nice story vessel to ease into it with the civil war going on in Garlemald. Like, they're not currently a threat. They are keeping themselves busy. So we have time to worry about all this other stuff. We don't really get into that. And then we're we're immediately bring up uh, the most important character in the history of Final Fantasy XIV. Gabu. Gabu, as we find out. I'm not inflecting it that way. Gabu. Gabu. Every single character that voices the name Gabu says it slightly differently, so I'm just going to continue saying Gabu. And Graha is here to help because we need to go look for Allegan Wisdom to hopefully find a cure for tempering. And Graha Tia suggests as a slaw, we get a new airship called the Bonanza. And the only thing that's really important here, actually, there's two things that are really important here. One, we're trying to help Gabu. Gabu is back, baby. And two, we get to take Graha Tia out on his first adventure post Shadowbringers, which I think is really heartwarming. And I was expecting a heartwarming scene where Graha kind of realizes that his dream has been, well, realized. And we didn't get that, so I wonder if it's coming later. Because if there's one thing Final Fantasy XIV is not subtle about, it's feelings. I was waiting. I was I was waiting for the moment where he where he like touches our shoulder and we turn around and the piano that Kyle hates starts playing, <laughs> and he tells us, "My friend, I'm so happy to finally get to adventure by your side." Well, he, we're in the awkward joke phase, right? Like he's not ready to make that connection. He was trying to like you know rehash his little gimmick. From back in the Crystal Tower business, uh, he, he, he's, he's waking up. He's coming online. He's coming out of his shell. He's still a very shy individual. Are you saying he can't wake up? Wake me up. No, I'm not saying that at all. Does someone need to save him? No, 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 no. From the... <laughs> As a slob, we'll continue to be like some... 27th expansion feel that place is insane i can't believe it happened in the second expansion of the game in heaven's word it is such a bogus area it's so visually busy yes with the storms and all the stuff flying and the and the guy who won't give me his darn triple triad card oh my god <laughs> but i i like the node jokes are cute you know the node calling him your highness and then getting mad anybody uh, time anybody like disrespected graha that was cute it led us back to sid and the ironworks where we had to like hack the node and get a bunch of computers together get all the cell phones in the room so that we could farm the bitcoins in order to get the password out of it anytime we sit down with alizé i'm, I'm just like this i'm this game is reminding me why i love these characters because uh, we get enough like the last time we did that was gabu wasn't it we were sitting near a cliff's edge looking up at the night sky and then when we we're at azasla before graha comes back having successfully found this this node this orb uh we, we sit down and just have a little moment with alizé where she like recalls what it was like doing a, a thesis for the studium 
And then Graha shows up and is like, huh, as an Archon, let me tell you, Archon theses are no walk in the park. We're definitely heading towards Studium, Charlayan, something big. I've been getting involved with my Sage quests. I'm looking forward to leveling that up. It's a really fun play style. And they're all about the Studium and the Charlayan and this whole idea of like, no involvement. Oh, we are about an academy. We don't possibly get involved in political matters. It's rubbing me the, ah, ah yes, yes reapers. reapers. We've dismissed those claims kind of way. I bet you a lot, a lot of Endwalker is going to be convincing Charleans to even interact with the state of the world because we're up in our ivory tower business. But before we move on, do you want more grinding gear? We know you're subbed to this channel. Obviously, uh, you would never watch this video without subscribing to the channel. But did you know we have other channels and a podcast? Well, you should go take a look at the Clips channel. You can also get the Grinding Gear podcast wherever it is you get your podcasts and even more extra content by checking out our Patreon or becoming a YouTube member. Just check out supportourbromance.com. Thanks for checking out our other channels. Thanks for the support. We appreciate it. So much happens and yet a lot of it is pretty nitty gritty in this next portion. But I am, for once, Kyle, weirdly into the nitty gritty of what Kryle is informing us of. We get an update on the state of the Empire from Kryle, including really bad kerning, so I didn't know it was the Third Legion. The Ill Legion. But Kryle seems to think it's really important that the Third Legion is being financially backed by House Brutus. Which I didn't remember, Kyle. I had to ask Stream. I was like, should I know that name and stream was like you should because it was asahi and yatsuyu's last name yeah it was, well, it's such a standout name yeah brutus yeah asahi was asahi sas brutus and, y and yatsuyu is yatsuyu go brutus so they Ooh, have go brutus yeah, <laughs> there's an e on there it's not spelt like uh the pokemon game in your pocket um i just realized most pokemon games are in your pocket pocket monsters yeah anyways Fan Daniel masquerading around quite flamboyantly in the body of Asahi. And the last we saw him was super excited to have access to Asahi's fortune. So here we see just a little bit of payoff of that setup from the previous meanwhile in the now gloomily lit Garlemald. All of this ends with Kral mentioning that the Empire is withdrawn from the Gimlet, which allows the Alliance to focus on other things like, hey, brokering peace with the Beast Tribes. Then Sid returns. We get a, a room with a supercomputer. Supercomputers in my MMO, Kyle. It's surely not. Not with all the sniper rifles and spaceships. And cars. And cars. Yeah, and cars. So a lot of, a lot of it to me like played out kind of like Star Trek techno babble gobbledygook. But I loved the part where they crack the information node orb. I do love good password humor. So from the previous scene with the whole... Password oh, is password. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was cute. We get it like the most Star Wars ass Star Wars scene in Final Fantasy XIV, a game that literally has characters named Biggs and Wedge. But we get a, an Allegan researcher projecting. I would I would go with Obi Wan in the prequel era style. You know the Obi Wan warning message that went out to all the Jedi. That's what the, this gave me more of a that vibe than a than a Leia distress vibe. My favorite is still the guy who goes. Ah, and dies. This whole presentation is one of those, much like our Asian PowerPoint. I'm like, excellent. We have it. It's in the bank. We got the footage. Let's reference it all the time. But for now, let's just talk about what I'm excited about, which is multi-layered tempering. My big wish coming out of Shadowbringers was let's go back to primals. Primals are badass. I want to know more about what's going on. Whatever happened in Sestasha Hard with the guy who had the squid face? That was kind of weird. And now we're getting an answer for it. When you get multi-tempered, you slowly transform, take on the ether of the primal's type that you are being influenced by, and you go basically from cultist to monster. You go from ifrit to like high priest, but eventually you graduate to monster. And that's awesome. And I can't wait to see more of that. But we also know some people who might be deeper into tempering, like the kobolds. Then before we move on, I, I do want to ask you about the whole stagnation bit, because uh, if I was to understand Owen correctly, stagnation is a part of any and all tempering. Because in Owen's 
lecture, he makes he uses Sephiroth as an example and talks about if Sephiroth tempers you, you will become attuned to Earth, and if that continues, you'll eventually essentially become a rock monster. Is kind of how I my interpretation, not Owen's words. But then Owen goes to talk about the actual process of tempering and that the mind is basically like wiped bare to make room for the influence of the temperament through stagnation. So stagnation and a side effect of light ether is present in all forms of tempering. The ethereal stagnation is it's not due to light though light is what we had with the sin eaters and therefore we have found a cure to sin eater stagnation and we can use that cure combined with grahati as memory transference to create and replace the stagnation slash memory overwrite that is happening on the tempered also is lord amon important and amon is always a big bad I agree. The name stands out. It is always a name that has like gravitas. Another seed planted, right? Like, don't think about it too much right now. But when it comes up later, you'll go, oh, right. Anyway, so the supercomputer, they use an AI. Like, what did they do? <laughs> they simulated a bunch of stuff with the super elegant computer. It explodes. It's a great little cutscene. as confused as I am by how Sid sounds. And we get a successful, we think, process for curing tempering but we're gonna need to test it first and so off to the most important character in final fantasy 14 we go gabu i refuse and gabu the little cockney boy oh (laughs) oh my god i'm so happy so happy you could come down here all this time my mind was filled with thoughts of Great Father Titan. I could be wrong. That sounds like the most obvious adult doing a child voice I've ever heard. <laughs> this sure sounds a whole lot like when I try and do a Cockney accent. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's something. It's something. My point is, I'm really glad they waited till now to give Gabu a voice, because I don't think I would be as smitten if this was the voice that came rolling out of that adorable little monster the first time we met him. Sure, the goal here is to humanize the kobolds, right? We always make them the others in a realm we're born, a force, a dangerous force that summons primals. And when we talk to Gabu and we interact with the other kobolds, outside of their quirk of referencing the thesaurus for a few words, they basically talk like normal people. But I liked how kind of uh, simple and straightforward this was once we got to the point of having a cure, right? Like we, they're, they're, they get pretty deep, pretty multi-layer deep, getting to the point where they have the information to try and make a cure or figure out how they actually go about curing someone of tempering. But then when they go to test it, take Abu aside, they give it a shot and it works. Yeah. I mean, basically what they're building up to me here is how exhausting this process is. Yes, And we have to counteract that by finding a better way to do it, making more pork seas, and that leads us down the whole Matoya pipeline. But we also have the Admiral's Quest. Continuing down the line of, let's put every side story Garrett cares too much about into one patch. We're off to see Matoya, and I get the exact scene I said I wanted. I need a scene where someone out to Master Matoya, the name that Ishtola went by on the first. Oh. I need a scene Admiral. where Ishtola's embarrassed. I need it. I merely adopted an alias in accordance with the custom of my hosts. And we get to run a really cute dungeon with one of my favorite songs in the game. I love the Banjo-Kazooie soundtrack. I'm nuts for it. I got it with my Nintendo Power when I was a kid, and I listened to it at nausea. This is so Halloween level. And it's nice to have a dungeon you smile at the end of, you know? I've been, been down around the dungeons a little bit lately. It's oh, nice to oh, just you're have... talking about the, the actual Warrior of Light response when you yeah. beat the dungeon? Yeah, you know, the, the pig's <laughs> tired and heaving. And you fight a giant queen pig. You fight mud man with a really cute like billiards mechanic. A really neat like water spirit thing. Uh, like it was- That fight is like really good. Really, really good. It feels raid quality in my opinion or like almost trial quality. There's not quite enough 
uh, phases, I think, to be its own standalone trial. But in terms of like set piece, arena design, uh, mechanics being a set piece within their own right, like it's to me, it's really tip top for a boss fight design in a in a in a dungeon. I was super impressed by that. And then it just, I I, it's, I find the pork sea so ridiculous in a way that I enjoy, if that makes sense. But it's like the stuff we're dealing with here. This is a pretty hefty patch i feel for narratively speaking like like to me gabu is one of the great tragedies in a game full of a lot of tragedy pretty realistic like coming to grips with oneself and in, in merway i'm talking about merway up here like being introspective and coming to terms with like all of the murder and death through war that she has wrought like this is a pretty grown-up story they're telling in 5.4 and literal cartoon flying pigs keep showing up. You know, the award-winning Final Fantasy game, it's one of those screenshots that you would not share until you're invested <laughs> in the game. The end of <laughs> this freaking dungeon is ridiculous. We fight an actual queen pig wearing a crown and successfully make a bunch of porksies. Things go far too well up to this point. Well, we're building that this is the most exhausting activity any of our high-level wizards have ever participated in. We don't even submit any ether to the whole pig business yet. It's not until the solo duty later that we find the actual stat implications of channeling ether into Alize or a pig queen at this point. But they're definitely setting up that this is not something you can just do. We can't just go around the world shotgunning every tempered person immediately. It's going to take time and it's going to take a lot of effort. And it might even take like a whole wizard school, which is, again, I think what they're building to with the studium and Charlayan. And then, Kyle, just when I thought this couldn't be custom made for me anymore, Merwib shows up. Yeah, and a fish wizard in the room. Fish wizard doesn't talk, but he's there. And <laughs> who's the cherry on top of a patch that is entirely for me? We get the one thing Kyle's been hyper fixated on since it happened, which is fish wizard. Even though fish wizard, yep. yeah, you're right. Fish wizard don't talk. But he's in the room. At the very least, we have Sahagan available. I mean, it also makes sense. These are the two beast tribes that are, you know, in the Limsa area. So like, that's not too surprising, but again, it was just, it just, I, it felt hilarious at this point. It was just everything I love. There's also a throwaway line, which is very dark, but also very important that if we're going to make peace with some beast tribes, we might want to do it in Limsa because, uh, well, Daw tends to just kill everybody. Like any time they find a tempered, any time they get in any sort of embroilment, just kill everybody. Well, so does the Maelstrom, I, and that's what Merwib is contending with here. Like it, it, she's taking a lot of ownership of her actions. I don't know. It, it was it was like character growth for Merwib, without, in my mind, getting rid of her edge, because then the, the plans that she enacts are still dangerous and swashbuckling and adventurous, and still show off her her leadership through strength, which I'm really happy about. I mean, the game plays the long con. This is a long time coming. We all knew in A Realm Reborn that this was a little, uh, a bit of an issue. What the city-states, the grand companies were doing with their land, with the people that were on it when they got there. And now we're starting to resolve that, and we do it in a very tactful way that's very interesting to watch. I enjoyed watching Merle Webb go around and talk to all the various pirate captains and factions that we got to see. What, what was the... The, the bloody executioners or who who was the one we I don't I don't remember but I just remember Sickard like the most like we we need a character quick that looks evil I know lock his face in a smirk yeah he had that he had that weird smirk that the pirates get in Void Arc oh you are like, not he wrong had that, like really the, stretched the, like smirk going on the whole time the sky pirate sneer. Yeah, yeah, the sky pirates near. But, you know, okay, pirate captain comes out in his pajamas. He's got the consumption, you know. And, like, it was a really good rundown that led us those to... Are, those are not pajamas. <laughs> that is Dom Toretto fashion. Thank you very much. Oh, of course. It, it leads us to the Cobalt High Priest, or here referred to as the Patriarch, but he's also the second one. Don't think about it too much. I love his hat. 
Like, <laughs> what was I doing? Take a look at your own hat. It'll tell you exactly what you were up to. You were summoning Titan over and over again. <sighs> yeah. Although, I mean, probably, I mean, of their own volition, they summoned Titan before they became tempered. So I have a feeling that, you know, they were probably worshiping Titan before Titan had summoned. So I bet that hat is a pre-tempering addition. And we had our solo fight where we got to see just how devastating to your own stats channeling ether is like even the warrior of light with all of our ether that we are so etherically dense we can have all these jobs at once that we are the 14th seat in some regard extra rejoined we're still completely winded by helping out even though we cure zada's tempering they still don't want any part of this and it's a great little rundown with merle webb's got just excellent fantasy names for their weapons, like total player names here when it comes to their guns. Well, that was Death Sentence, wasn't it? Yeah, Death Sentence, exactly. What, a, like, what a freaking, uh, yeah. And uh, kudos to the game for going through the effort of actually animating a kobold holding a gun. Yeah. Because Lord knows other most probably would have skimped on this, but I thought it was effective. Did the whole fire in the air thing, classic. And it, it takes Gabu vouching for us for there to even be like a glimmer of hope with Zadu. That with the Charlayan thread that I'm pulling, we're trying to unite all of the source because Garlemald is going that far. And if you didn't think Garlemald was going far enough, we got our next scene right there for you to linger while you wait for the next patch. What in the world is that? What a top tier linger it is, too. Like, this is the kind of MMO world changing stuff that I enjoy. Just such a great mystery to just sit in the game. Like, when we saw the Void Arc out in the distance that first time, that stuff is so exciting. The moon thing they did in 1.0 is so tantalizing. The tower is always right out of grasp, like right out in the horizon where you can't go. And the, the way the game, it, it's for me, having played other MMOs, the way the game handles it is impressive from a like a, a technical aspect. Because this is the type of thing as a longtime WoW player that I associate with kind of one-time big patch experiences or instanced events, but like this is, this is seamless. These things just pop up in the world in areas they don't even need to be in unless maybe that's a spoiler. Maybe the, the, the towers are there in zones we're going to go to throughout all of Endwalker or something. I, I, I don't know. I think that'd be awesome if they expanded on their current zones and that's like the Endwalker zone is just a little bit deeper into, you know, the Dravanian forest or something like that. Just a little bit deeper outside of Ralgar's reach. Whatever the case is, it, technically speaking, I was really impressed. They didn't need to go that far. They didn't need to have the towers and all these other places right here. And now, I love the design of them. You know I me, mean? I'm, I'm not huge into elegant looking things. I'm not even that uh, married to the Garlemald look of things. It's not my favorite aesthetic. I like my more traditional fantasy stuff when it comes to 14. But I really like how these towers look. They look cool. They look menacing. Uh, yeah, okay, I've seen a million sky beams. W whatever. Final Fantasy XIV has earned its overused sky beam, as far as I'm concerned. I like Geigerian tech. I love organic mixing with technology, and you can see the little plates on it. It's pulsing. You know, it's, it's, it's the cell phone tower. It's doing some pulsing. It's shooting lasers into the sky, but it's all over our planet. So they're not pointing at one thing together. And there's six of them that we're aware of right now, all sort of in distance in some regard to a major city. But as for what they are, I would assume some sort of technological tempering because that's the thread we're on right now. And it makes sense with a zombie man at the end. He, he seemed mind controlled, set up a bunch of mind controlled towers outside of all the major cities. It was a pretty decent plan. They're not right outside the major cities. That would give away the goose. But you set them up in, you know, trafficked areas where people move through. You know, people are on their way to uh, on their way to the Golden Saucer. They take a wrong turn and end up mind controlled for Garlemald. I think I'm in the same boat. I think these are essentially ma man-made tempering devices. I don't know how exactly they're doing it. But 
I, 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 they found a way to weaponize primal behavior, which makes sense because Xenos has essentially been a primal before, or at least rode a primal. And they're feeding primals to the various weapons they're making too. So they're definitely in high interactivity with primals. They've already been weaponizing primals. Yes. They've been doing that for a while. There's also maybe a subplot that we can read into where the funder of the crystal stealing was House Brutus. And so they might be messing with crystals and the Beastmen anyway. So why would the Genos be okay with this, but not Black Rose? Is it because this weapon uh, sends soldiers or men as as a weapon and they can still be fought and so we the warrior of light still have a chance whereas we can't fight a gas it's not a perfect like gentleman's weapon to make everybody feral or zombies or crazy but it would be a battlefield of perhaps beautiful chaos and if you're gonna do like the the orchestration madman sort of thing and everybody's fighting that is way more seductive to a xenos type than just i breathed wrong and falling over that's fair. I've been thinking about it a lot. A lot since, because I'm like, I'm pretty sure these are tempering devices that don't know exactly how they work. And then I was like, well, wait, hold up. Why is Xenos okay with this, but not okay with that? And like, I think it all works out, right? Because like even the device itself, because you can say, well, that's kind of like Black Rose. You can't fight the thing that tempers you. But Xenos knows we are immune to tempering. And Xenos was mostly pissed about Black Rose because it would just like kill us and we wouldn't have a chance. We can't fight. We can't show our prowess over like a nerve agent, but we can over hand to hand combat. So I think it all checks out. I'm this is this is it. It's a tempering device, and I even know Zeno. I think I know Xenos's motive behind it. I can't use that information to justify Lunar Bahamut, but I am very excited to see what multi tempering tower does and what monster models we're gonna get out of that. Because that could be really badass. Going back to the Owen tempering explainer, was there anything mentioned in there of how it messes with like ethereal flow on the person that's being tempered? Because if there's a way through tempering to uh, to manipulate the ethereal flow, could you essentially siphon the ether from these people, leaving a tempered husk behind, and then use that collected ether into that, fire it into the sky, summoning first beasts? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So rather than suppressing or stagnating, you end up harvesting. Oh, I like harvesting. Oh, yeah. I harvest some souls, some life force. Hell yeah. Let's do that. That's dark. That's creepy. Okay. Right here. The phenomenon we call corruption refers to the alteration of the ether of the soul. Said ether ordinarily exists in equilibrium, no one element being more prominent than another. But when subject is exposed to ether of an icon, this changes their soul, taking on the properties of the entity in question. And this is where we get into the Sephiroth example, where the subject ether becomes aligned to the element of Earth. Which makes sense because we're aligning people with the lunar <laughs> dimension, or the lunar energy source. That's why we have lunar kind of Cthulhu-esque, windy-faced Bahamut. So is, is that is that what's going on here? Are they are they using d d some sort of device to like? Uh, I, but I d I don't know why that would then leave behind a still mobile uh, uh, husk that can talk and yell glory for Garlemald. Because to me, it seemed like this. Sure, it seems like this person was tempered not by a primal, but by Garlemald. Because that was not a Garlean soldier that came back. That was a scout from Alamigo. Right, but that's stage one. That's cultist level. We need to see in future patches if we're gonna do. High priest into monster. Yeah, and so are they using what is what is the ether that's like aligned with lunar power? I don't know, zodiac, right? Like, yeah, they they they've invented their own, but bringing Bahamut, who came from space, it, it's an interesting choice because it could have been anything. Now, granted, it's an evocative model; it was definitely a model reused. But the whole windy face Cthulhu business they had it kind of going on there. It did suggest moon business and Bahamut was also from space and these spires are pointing in space. And then you also get our our second meanwhile, because our first meanwhile was meanwhile and like at the Alamegan front, uh, we get meanwhile in Garlemald and we actually get a scene between Fan Daniel and from Xenos. If Fan Daniel says, The piles have been driven as planned. The pile, like pile driver, like you're driving an actual pile or a pylon. Like those are the, those are the friggin' the towers that have appeared yeah your stakes your ley lines your points yep. of power 
And he says, And the first of the beasts has roared to life. First the beast we fought, literal the first beast was the first boss when we did the final days in Amarat Dungeon Run. Right, and the has roared to life, I assume that's Lunar Bahamut. So that harvest that you kind of theorized could be spent to bring out first beast creatures. I said ley lines there. I don't think that's the case because one of the first places I wanted to check was the step because we knew that was a source of power. So these seem to be in locations where they can harvest people, not harvest the life flow and the energy. Yeah, and I, I don't know how far to take that, right? Like, because they were with the with like the burn, right? That was the ether sucked straight from the land. Yeah. And if all you need is like the power of ether to like summon a primal or for creation magics, doesn't matter. Does it have to be ether from people versus ether from land? Isn't ether at the end of the day simply ether? I don't have an answer either. That's a, that's a great question. I'm, I'm connecting a lot of things here. I don't know how they all necessarily fit together, but I, there's some sort of tempering power, I think, going on with the towers that is leading to a siphoning of energy to hopefully summon the monsters that brought upon the final days in Amarat. And we already have the first of those monsters being Lunar Bahamut. I don't know the ins and outs, but that's how I'm connecting it all because that's how Fan Daniel seems to be connecting them all. Hey, the piles have been driven and a beast is here. Huzzah. He seems so gallantly happy about it. Well, he's nuts. Chaos for chaos sake. We're not really sure what's going on there, but we've crossed a bridge. Fan Daniel has introduced himself to the Scions. He never wanted to do anything with bringing back anybody's from Zodiac. He just wants everything destroyed. Chaos absolute. And uh, Zeno seems like a great partner for that. I do not expect Final Fantasy, with all their characterization, all their hard work put into their villains, to stay at this level. Like, it's easy to say, oh, it's Joker level. Let's burn the pile of money. But there's something else going on here. To me, I, I believed him. It seemed like he just wants to die and he's spiteful and wants to take everyone with him. Agent of Chaos, that shit. Yeah. Xenos is a, a like a... I mean, basically like a junkie, right? Like an adrenaline junkie, junkie or a combat junkie. Like he just wants someone to challenge him. And I think Van Daniel just wants to watch the world burn for lack of a better overused movie quote. Well, the important part is he used a dragon model, which means Astinia needs to come back in because we got to kill some dragons. Yes, the exterminator. Got to call the exterminator. Let's we got do dragon it. Dragon problem. Also, Xenos is very excited to have his session of D anD D, where all he does is shop for a new weapon. Yeah, he's going to look for a new weapon. Which he destroys a sword, but I can't really see him not using a sword. He has destroyed his sword too in the past. Like we broke one of his katanas, and he just got another katana. Yeah, he just goes and gets more swords. So what's he going to do? I, I don't know. It's Final Fantasy. He could probably have like a sword with five other swords on it. I mean, other people have had job changes, right? Does Xenos change his job? He could change Does his job. show up with a big two-handed axe or something, decides I'm going to go warrior. Oh, it was it was Sage and Reaper, right? So he's definitely not going to Sage. Sex would be weird. It can't be Sage guns, right? Like that would be ridiculous. Like he's like, you know, pushing up his glasses and like shooting lasers. No, no, no. But, you know, the, the site you're harvesting, you harvest all the souls, you harvest out of the towers. It, you know, it would be poetic. Symbolically, yes. Yeah. How Xenos likes to fight. I don't know if I buy it. Well, we all know that a scythe is a 2d4 and a katana is a 1d10. So he's losing a bit of damage. You're such a nerd. Scythe damage sucks in D&D and it's always bothered me. <laughs> Oh, that's why I love you. To the right. To the right. I'm looking. I'm looking. It's good whiz biz. Wait, this thing on the floor? That's hideous. Oh my god. That's horrifying. Oh what the god. shit? <laughs> Can I unsee that? Holy crap. Can I get one for my room? Oh my god. Oh, <laughs> What the hell? Did you find us at a yard sale, Matoya? Wow.